Hey, welcome to Two Rails. My name is Chris. Uh, you are watching right now. This is video number 100 to be uploaded to the channel, which I think is pretty crazy and awesome. And I couldn't let this moment go by without celebrating it in some way, doing something a little bit special. And I tried to think what that could be, and I realized I have been holding on to some footage that I recorded late last year uh, when I visited the Virginia Museum of Transportation, which has some really, really awesome stuff in it. Uh, I have done some minimal editing to it. I've done a little bit of commentary for you. Uh, but here it is. It's about half an hour's worth. So if you like it, hit like. If you like what we do, click subscribe. And if you want to show other people, hit the share button. Uh, if you want to make some suggestions for other places we can go, things we can do, things we can see, uh, be sure to leave a uh, comment in the comment section below. Thanks, and have a great day. Enjoy the video. All right, so getting to Roanoke is pretty easy. It is about four hours from where I live in Northern Virginia. It is straight out west on I-66 and then south on I-81 for a decent while. Once you get into Roanoke itself, it is fairly easy to find the Virginia Museum of Transportation. It is not far from I-581, I think is the interstate that you see just off to the right there. And there is the Museum of Transportation. It is located in the former Norfolk and Western Freight Depot in Roanoke. It is crazy to think that once upon a time, instead of being a lobby and exhibit space, uh, it was full of men working, loading packages on and off of rail cars. Uh, there used to be platforms up to kind of boxcar floor height in the rail yard that have all been removed since then. Most people are aware of the Norfolk and Western's rich history in Roanoke, but a lot of people also forget that the Virginian also passed through town and had a yard in the city. These are plans for one of the Virginian railway steam locomotives. There's the tender. And we'll swing around and look at the locomotive itself. For a long time, the Virginian Railway was electrified across West Virginia. Most of that has been ripped out and there is minimal evidence of it left today. There are a couple of examples of the Virginian electric locomotives out in the rail yard and we will see one of those later. The Virginian Depot does still stand. It's a couple of miles away from the Museum of Transportation. It is used as an events venue Norfolk and Western liked to order their diesel locomotives with three unique features. Uh, long hood was designated as the Ford direction. They ordered a high short hood, and they also ordered their locomotives with dual control stands that allowed their engineers to sit on either side of the locomotive and be facing in the right direction. Norfolk and Western and the Southern Railway were the last two railroads to order their locomotives with the long hood designated as the Ford end. Ostensibly it was for safety reasons, but in later years it was for better crew visibility. This is a CTC panel. It was used in Roanoke to control switches and signals, I believe on the Norfolk and Western Railway.
This is an old Norfolk and Western safety instruction car. Unfortunately, because of uh, pandemic restrictions, it was closed. Of course, one of the great benefits of this location is that the Norfolk Southern line is right across the fence. We'll see several trains today. There's an old baggage car to the right. That Jeep 9 ahead. And what is that? It's an SD45. And an old Chesapeake Western Baldwin. Two of the locomotives I came to see. It's a lot of freight equipment in the rail yard. It took me a second to figure out what this was, but it is a dynamometer car. There is a model of it in the cabinet inside. And another intermodal train headed north or east. Some unique power in the yard. This is a GE SL85 from AEP. There's an old Southern boxcar. This is one of the electric locomotives and you can see what looks to be a fuel tank but is not. It is a clever disguise for some electrical equipment. And here is the odd job. SD40-2. The Jeep Slug Set. on the back. I mean shoving platform. In 1976, several of the major railroads and a few of the minor ones put together special uh, paint schemes to celebrate the bicentennial of the United States, 200 years since 
the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And this was one of the pieces that Norfolk and Weston did for that commemoration. They also did a hopper car and a trailer, which we will see later. That was an RFID tag they used to track railroad equipment. That big wheel is a handbrake. Note the F at the long hood end. The F designates the front of the locomotive or the direction it goes when the reverser is placed in the forward position. Norfolk and Weston would order their locomotives with that designation up through the late 70s. Just a few weeks after this trip, I received my model of the 1776 from Scale Trains. And it runs great. This is another locomotive I came to see. It is a Baldwin that served the Chesapeake Western Railway in Harrisonburg for about 20 years. There were three of them that ran between Elkton and Bridgewater and south down to Stanton. This one has been cosmetically restored. It does not have all of its running gear on the inside, so it cannot operate on its own. The Baldwins were succeeded in the mid 60s by uh, Norfolk and Western Power, Alco T6s. Ostensibly, two of them were sold by Norfolk and Western to the Chesapeake Western Railway, which they owned by that point, and a third was permanently leased. Number 40 became number 10, number 41 became number 11, and number 42 was the long term lease. And I actually didn't notice it until editing, but this is number 11 that's been repainted back into its Norfolk and Western colors, which means that half of the Chesapeake Western's assigned motive power is at the Virginia Museum of Transportation. Norfolk and Weston's Roanoke shops produced a large number of steam locomotives during its time. There are really only three examples remaining. This is Class A 1218, which last operated in 1994. It was an excursion service. Again, this one has been cosmetically restored. It's understood that all of the parts needed are stored and owned by the museum, so it could probably be returned to service fairly easily. But it would still be an expensive job, much like 611 was. The cab to the locomotive is open for viewing with these panels in the rear end.
like all Norfolk and Western steam locomotives, 1218 is coal powered. And while it can be shoveled by hand, in most cases they used the automated or the motorized auger that you can see in the bottom of the tender there. That would feed down through a small pipe and up into the firebox. All right, I can't help myself. One thing I noticed when you look at some of the older examples of locomotives, the handrail that the crew would use when walking along the footplate there is attached to the body of the locomotive itself. It was good for holding onto, but it didn't offer much protection from the side, except in very specific places like around where the ladders and steps were. In later years, they put together handrails that were mounted to the side and kind of enclosed the footsteps and made it a lot safer. That's an old Norfolk and Western passenger car. There are several interesting passenger cars in the fleet. This is an old FTB unit, which was Southern, but has been painted to look like the GE demonstrators. This is an EMD NW2 from the Wheeling in Lake Erie. Note the F on the side designating the front end. This is a well car. It looks like it has maybe some kind of generator load sitting on it. Well cars are typically used to take high loads. This is one of the original trailer train flat cars used to transport trailers. You can see there are the guide rails on the side. Traditionally, these would be loaded by a tractor pulling the trailer onto the train down the length of the train. These days they use a crane and they just pick them up and put them on. Once the trailer was loaded, this would be uh, raised as a hitch and the kingpin would be mounted inside it to help secure the trailer. The underside of this trailer isn't looking super great. The trailer train company was put together by the Pennsylvania Railroad and several other companies, including the Norfolk and Western. It is still owned by several railroads today, and it is a, essentially a leasing pool company for intermodal equipment and some other things, like boxcars and gondolas. This is probably an 85 footer, but it was built in February of 1955. And that is what they look like today. And there is a yellow trailer train well set. You see the TTX on the side. This 
This is a research car. It has a large number of sensors and other gadgets and gizmos mounted underneath it, as well as some computer equipment on the inside. They're used to read the track condition and report potential defects so that they can be addressed and monitored over time. This car isn't used so much anymore, but Norfolk Southern has at least two sets of research equipment. Now I am ashamed to admit I did not realize this locomotive was here, built by GE and the Pennsylvania Railroad. This is a GG1 perhaps the most famous electric locomotive in the world. These operated in relatively high speed service along the Northeast Corridor for upwards of 50 years. They were finally replaced in the early 80s by the AEM-7. This one served the Pennsylvania Railroad and Amtrak. Now I noted this unit doesn't have an F on the side, but it is safe to assume that the long hood is designated as the Ford end, as most Norfolk and Western locomotives are. It's painted in the Tuscan red scheme, which was common for the passenger assigned locomotives. Inside there you can see the 16 cylinder prime mover, it's a V16 so there are 8 on each side. And again like most Norfolk and Western equipment this has dual control stands. This was the trailer that I noted earlier being painted for the Bicentennial. This is NWZ. Any trailers that don't have flanged wheels, like the railroad wheels, get a reporting mark with a Z at the end. There are several buses on site that were at the Commonwealth Coach and Trolley Museum that suffered a fire and several buses were destroyed. Those may actually be some burn marks at the top of that one from the fire back in 2017. And of course that caught my attention. There's a dash bus from Arlington I believe. It took me a little bit of research to figure out what this was. It is a, it is an A7 Corsair II. These were built originally for the Navy to replace the A4 Skyhawk. Hopefully its wings aren't far away and they can be reunited at some point.
Now there was one other thing in the museum that I came to see. I will preface by saying I am a massive Back to the Future fan. The DeLorean was one of my dream cars. To be honest, it still is. I would love to own one. I don't know. I just think they're really cool. Now I do love the museum's attention to detail here, as a fan of the movie. They have a sedan version of the Biff car sitting just beside the DeLorean. They note that it isn't the convertible version like the movie, but it's probably the best they could do. There's also plenty of other interesting pieces, like this robot car from Virginia Tech. There's this race car that has very obviously sticker headlights. That just looks cool. an old yellow taxi. This Chevy SS Camaro is pretty cool. It was found in a barn of all places. Who knows what's out there? All right, so that was a tour of the Virginia Museum of Transportation. Uh, that is not all of what they have to see. Uh, I really hope that uh, things start opening back up again fairly soon. I would love to take my family down there and visit the museum and see some of the more interactive exhibits that they have once they start becoming available again. Uh, so I will be back down there at some point, hopefully later this year. Uh, again, if you liked what you saw in today's video, uh, go ahead, click the like button. Uh, if you enjoyed what we were doing, if you want to see more of it, uh, go ahead, click subscribe. We'll be posting videos every week for the foreseeable future. Uh, if you want to make suggestions of places we can go, things we can do, uh, go ahead, drop a comment below. I would love to hear your suggestions. Thanks. Have a great day.